Hello, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for BKA Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Charts of the Week for January 31st of 2022. Please see your disclaimer for important information. Well, as we start this week, we check in with our weekly high-frequency data, courtesy of our friends up in uh, Chicago at First Trust. As you can see in the week-over-week -week data, which is in the far right column, we have a few green uh, areas here, open table, restaurants are up slightly for the week. Uh, TSA checkpoint data is still down, uh, but supply of motor gasoline and global commercial flights are up. We still have negative numbers uh, in other areas such as hotel occupancy, rail car traffic, steel production. Uh, and on the staffing index, uh, we continue to improve, obviously labor being extremely tight. Uh, overall, uh, continuing claims, you can see the data there. Uh, but, you know, month over month, uh, we, we are positive in rail traffic, steel production. Hotel occupancy is up, but that number has been very volatile as of late. Uh, you can see the change versus 2019. And basically, most of these uh, categories were, uh, were relatively uh, uh, below. And in fact, we've, we've, we've worsened in a few cases, particularly in open table uh, and TSA checkpoint data, a lot of that, as we've mentioned over the last several weeks, has been due to Omicron. Uh, do expect as the variant rolls over that those numbers should improve both on a weekly basis, monthly basis, as well as relative to 2019. Now, we just had a GDP uh, number uh, here for the uh, fourth quarter. Uh, and the actual number came in at 6.9%. The estimates were around 5.5%. You can see on the left-hand side, kind of a, a moving uh, you know, quarterly data uh, set for the contributions uh, made by the various components to that GDP number. And you can see just in the aggregate, if you kind of kind of discount the, the, the extreme low and the high relative to the shutdown and the bounce back, that we've been tracking at an above average level if you look back to 2017. And the, the numbers overall have actually been pretty good. But what has been the source of those has been really the most uh, unique thing. Obviously, consumer spending you know, has been very important to uh, continued growth. And overall, we know that consumer spending accounts for about 70% of overall GDP. Now, in the last quarter, that was not necessarily uh, the case. And it was uh, really more due to inventories, which is that category that's highlighted down here. And on the right-hand side, you can see, you know, inventories contribution to GDP growth. And, and without getting caught up in, in the individual quarterly numbers, you can just see that, you know, for several quarters here, uh, it's inventories have been a drag. And we've been talking about you know, inventory depletion at the retail level, uh, at the producer level because of supply shortages and a lot of components and the supply chain choke points. And, you know, we just know that the inventories have been have been tough to build for a lot of producers because of these constraints. And so uh, it is actually very good to see that inventories are back up. And as I've mentioned time and time again over the last six months, I fully expected inventories to be a tailwind to growth. And that was indeed the case uh, this quarter, uh, as it was a little bit last quarter. So we are seeing inventory rebuild, you know, not to discount the fact that we still have plenty of supply chain issues out there, but this is positive in the sense that it looks like maybe on the margin, some of this uh, is uh, easing a little bit. Uh, but uh, needless to say, uh, you know, in this number for the last quarter, really have too much contribution from housing. We certainly haven't had a contribution from business investment. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and uh, uh, But consumer spending still remains a, a tailwind to some degree. Uh, so uh, obviously we'll be excited to uh, get into this uh, first quarter a little bit further, see what February and March have to hold and begin to make our estimates uh, for, for 1Q GDP uh, here fairly shortly. So as we talked about, business investment uh, has has actually been fairly strong. We, we know the CEOs have been um, relatively upbeat on long term prospects, not so much in the last couple of quarters. So and, you know, we see commitments to 
to increase capital spending uh, have been pretty strong actually through most of the end of 2020 and into 2021, uh, but that's tempered a little bit. And you can see on the right-hand side kind of the breakdown of that uh, business fixed investment uh, number, BFI. And you can see that, you know, essentially intellectual property and equipment has been relatively strong, uh, but, you know, the overall number has been pretty tepid, kind of anchored by structures, and that number continues to weaken. So when you look at business investment as a contributor to GDP growth, just think about the structure side. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, fixed, uh, you know, plant uh, and equipment, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of uh, commercial enterprises, it, it certainly uh, encompasses uh, office space and things like that as firms are trying to rationalize what's going to happen uh, in the go forward environment. So, uh, and the trend has actually been negative on structures within the BFI category. And, and I certainly expect that to continue and, and be somewhat of an anchor to what uh, overall, or I guess I should say otherwise, would be somewhat positive spending, particularly on software, uh, intellectual property, uh, and, uh, and equipment. Now, what we're looking at here is essentially a lot of the same data that we've been looking at the last few slides related to real GDP growth. And, uh, but with an added component in the red here is what we might expect going forward. Now, this is a forecast from Wells Fargo. Uh, and it's just a really kind of a, a loose proxy for what some of the more informed thinkers are envisioning for economic growth over the coming quarters certainly not representative of a broad sample size and nor nor would be an average of analysts expectations but so uh, if you look at real gdp in 2021 kind of expected to you know fall in that 5.7 5.8 you know percent uh, you know when, when it's all said and done uh, and the estimate by wells fargo is about 3.9 for 2022 now I can tell you that the, the estimates are pretty wide ranging, which is not atypical for this time of the year because there's just a lot that we don't know yet, right? And, and so the estimates are anywhere between like 3% and four and a quarter with some outliers on either side of that. And so uh, this is certainly within range. So what it represents here is, um, you know, if you look over a long period of time, you know, and this time series goes back to 1950, you can see, you know, obviously mostly up, very uh, limited downside, uh, but usually uh, accompanied by recessions that, you know, that this expectation uh, looking out uh, over uh, the coming year and even uh, into uh, 2023, you know, which uh, I think those forecasts are, are looking for somewhere maybe around three, three and a half percent, uh, which, by and large would be good in a normal uh, you know, in inflationary environment. And that would put, if you add back inflation to this and normalize inflation of maybe 3%, you know, that gets you to nominal growth of anywhere between you know, six to six and a half percent, which is actually really, really good. Now we'll take a quick look at uh, personal consumption and how it breaks down into goods and services. And uh, obviously we, we just talked about the fact that the consumption element is really important to overall GDP. And that's illustrated here that, you know, rarely uh, do you see, uh, uh, you know, downturns on, on personal consumption, usually tied to recessions, usually tied to, you know, big events that cur curb income, uh, and, um, and, and usually, you know, maybe the purchasing power because we were dealing with high bouts of inflation, you know, and there are other factors that go into it, but you can see here that, you know, goods spending last year, uh, was very, very strong. And, and we know that this has been the issue for the supply chain constraints because goods demand has been exceptionally strong. And if you look over on the right side, you know, 2020, when everything was shut down or at very limited capacity, that personal consumption on services was extremely low. Now, naturally, you'd expect a, a bit of a bounce back in the following year, and that did occur as we did reopen. Uh, but, you know, if you think about services relative to goods, 
you know, they're both important, you know, but we typically don't have a big downtick in services because some of these things are discretionary, but uh, a lot are not discretionary. And so outside of, you know, what happened in 2020, I mean, we've had very uh, few instances outside of the Great Depression where we've actually seen a downtick. Uh, uh, maybe more so on the on the goods consumption side, but both those things working in tandem is a really powerful signal for the overall sustainability of the economy. Uh, do expect that these numbers, you know, won't be as strong uh, looking ahead, but again, that there's nothing wrong with that. All right, uh, gonna look at, you know, GDP levels uh, right now, relative to the pre-pandemic trend. And we've got a couple of things to look at here. You know, and, and on the left-hand side, if you look at, um, you know, and I think it's important to consider inflation in this. So we'll, we'll look at the kind of the heavier uh, outlined area. And you can see inflation adjusted GDP, while we've had a tremendous recovery, uh, we're actually not back up to the trend that had been established before the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, credit, you know, the great job the economy has done up until now, uh, but just recognize that on an inflation adjusted basis that we're not back up to the trend line that we uh, basically that pre pandemic trend. Now, on the right side, you can see, you know, some of the reasons why. Um, and, and, and this is uh, in that blue line where it says negative 1.6. That's kind of that that shortfall. Uh, uh, on that inflation uh, adjusted number. And uh, you can see services has a lot to do with that. We just got through talking about how services really got hammered in the shutdown, uh, but also on, on the export side. So we just didn't export as much and that was a, a, a pretty significant drag. Uh, exports and imports, you know, we, we uh, had a bigger, you know, just call it, you know, the net of that represents our net trade number. and. Uh, that is a component of GDP, but if we're up eight uh, and down 10, you know, then the net impact of trade has not been uh, not been positive at all. So really services and net trade uh, have uh, so far prevented us from reattaining that prior level. Uh, but as you can see, you know, we are uh, continuing to battle back uh, towards that trend line. And I would expect us to probably reattain that here uh, in the next uh, several quarters. Now we'll get into more of, I guess I'll, I'll call the current indicators. Uh, so on the left hand side, we've got durable goods orders, uh, X transportation. Uh, and we know transportation orders are actually picking up, but this is a kind of a control set that, uh, that excludes that uh, just for conversation's sake. And that number looks good. Obviously, durable goods orders, you know, have been strong. Uh, we've been talking about that at nauseum, and that's placed a, a real uh, uh, strain on the uh, supply chain and being able to meet those orders. And on the right-hand side, I found this uh, chart, which I thought was really telling and kind of helps to explain a lot of things. And this is basically unfilled orders for U.S. household appliance manufacturing, like washing machines, things like that. And you can see how that number really spiked over the last year. So we have a lot of unfilled orders, huge backlogs, but pretty high demand. Now we've been talking so much about the global supply chain monitor, I thought we, you know, we'd go ahead and pull it up. And uh, there is some decent news on the horizon here. Uh, and, and we'll just talk about the chart on the left for a second. So dark line represents a global supply chain pressure index. And this is this is kind of a an indicator of a lot of different data points that comes together to say, you know, how much pressure is there in the chain? Well, that's obviously high. And, and you know, we've kind of known that. So uh, so we know that the supply chain is is really constrained right now. Uh, now, the other line, the yellow line, represents the Baltic Dry Index, and that is, a, I know we've shown this a couple of times in charts of the week in uh, over the last month here, and that number continues to fall, and that represents the cost of seaborne freight. And you think about seaborne freight, you think about containers, 
and container ships and, and the cost of shipping is going down. And so the delta uh, between these two and the fact that directionally the Baltic dry index is moving down actually tends to suggest that some of these supply chain issues are beginning to ease a bit. Uh, now, in the path, in the prior slide, we talked about auto production and how that was not included in that durable goods orders number. Well, now here we have this number. This is the auto production uh, across many different geographies. And you can see the kind of the blue line there represents the U.S. And you can see that, you know, maybe we're not tracking to uh, the uh, the level that we were at pre-pandemic. And so the, the basically everything's indexing to November of 2019. And, and obviously we're, we're below that level, but we are moving higher. You can see that in several countries. In fact, every country listed in this chart is moving higher. So again, the positive, we know that semiconductor shortages have been at the root of a lot of the uh, delays and, and declines in auto production. But the good news here is that that is beginning to pick up. Quick shot on labor here. Uh, what's interesting uh, is that 2022 on a seasonal basis uh, is actually very, very low. Uh, continuing claims, we're not seeing that. It's a very tight labor market. You can see that in kind of that deep, deep, almost purple there on the lower left of this chart as we're just starting out like essentially week one and two uh, here in, in, in the new year. And, and you see that relative to prior years and we're at an exceptionally low rate. And here's a quick look at the housing industry. Not a shock here. Uh, we have a full set of 2021 data now which is in that really deep, uh, thick blue line uh, there at the bottom. Uh, this is not a surprise to anybody, particularly anybody that's in the real estate, uh, residential real estate sector. Uh, numbers extremely low active listings, you know, very tight. And on the right hand side, you've got pending home sales uh, year over year. Uh, and, and this is actually an index that gets tracked and reported on a monthly basis. Uh, and it was actually worse than expected in December. And a lot of that has to do with available supply, you know, months of supply on the market we know is near historic lows. Uh, and that's obviously resulting in choke points and being able to, uh, uh, you know, being able to, you know, witness higher sales. And we know active listings are, are pretty light right now. And we'll talk about real inventories again. And this is, um, uh, you know, we'll talk about this in, in really a, a couple of uh, areas here. So real inventories, you know, we saw how that was a significant contributor to GDP. Now, th this is actually the, the, the raw data itself for retail inventories. And um, so the survey was actually pretty tepid. Uh, you know, the, the, the estimated uh, level of retail inventories on a month over month basis was really not expected to be that dramatic. Uh, well, in December it was. It was almost, uh, call it uh, three, three times as high as expected. And, uh, you know, and we talked about trade too. And you can see, you know, on the right hand side, really uh, what's, what's been emblematic of, you know, uh, a faster recovery in the U.S. relative to other countries. You can see, you know, the uh, imports uh, continuing to spike higher. So demand in the U.S. for imported goods has been really, really high. And you can see the trade balancing goods um, is, is it continues to weaken. Now we're going to turn our attention to the investment markets, and obviously there's no shortage of things that we can talk about there, uh, given the recent volatility in the markets. Uh, you know, but uh, for someone who's been around a long time, been through many rodeos and downturns, you know, you always look for the silver linings, and you always take advantage of these opportunities to uh, implement things in the portfolio that you think will uh, have a, a positive reaction to you know, after this uh, bout of volatility, after this reset, if you will. And you can see here, both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ index, uh, you see those two uh, red circles for each. Now, you know, basically 
the valuation excesses, and these are forward price to earnings ratios. And, and, and we know that those things have come down as we were sitting in 2020 in the summer, uh, really almost in, through the end of that year, what we were dealing with were just extraordinarily high valuations. I mean, really almost unsustainable valuations. And those have, be, have really kind of worked their way down uh, as earnings have grown faster than prices have gone up, even though prices did go up. Uh, well, that brought multiples down, uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit better value. Uh, and as you can see here, this latest downturn has really kind of brought values back to where they were before the pandemic. Now, it's not to say that stocks are cheap. Uh, that's not the case, but they're being brought down to a level that I think from a valuation standpoint makes a lot, lot more sense. So, uh, and again, this is forward PE ratios. Uh, again, some of this depends on what you feel about, you know, the integrity of current forecasts for earnings. Uh, for index members, uh, but good news here is valuations have been reset down to levels that we were uh, actually somewhat comfortable with before the pandemic. Now, speaking of company guidance, um, you know this, this is something that it you know bears watching, uh, and we can see the the historical trend line going back to 2001, and uh, you can see you know with the recession overlays here. Uh, what's really interesting is that, you know, just, you know, for the better part of the last decade, with the you know, exception of, you know, various points in time uh, during when when the Fed was uh, raising rates, uh, you know, did, did, did we see some negative uh, uh, earnings guidance? Uh, and, and overall, it's been positive, uh, but lately we've seen a bit of a downtick. And so obviously this bears watching. Uh, we have seen a lot of company announcements and people talking about inflation, talking about labor, uh, talking about availability of, of supply to be able to generate a supply of components, I should say, to be able to get end products out into the market. So we've seen a bit of a tempering in the guidance. And I'm not going to say that this is a causal factor uh, and certainly not the sole causal factor behind uh, the volatility, but it's certainly a contributor to it. And uh, and I think it's healthy to have that at this point in time uh, because uh, guidance and optimism has just been extremely strong over the last year, almost, really almost too strong. And you knew that level of optimism was going to be tough to maintain. So as we talk about tech stocks, we talk about the NASDAQ, which is very tech heavy. Uh, the pullback uh, that we've seen in January uh, really uh, is remarkable in the sense that, you know, on the left-hand side, you can see that, you know, NASDAQ sell-offs during the month of January uh, are not, you know, terribly uncommon. You know, January is a reasonably good month uh, for stocks in general, but for the NASDAQ, we've had some notable sell-offs and uh, not necessarily recently, but this year really takes the cake. We've seen a uh, a 13% drop from peak to, uh, to, to present or peak to trough, I guess, if you will. Again, helping to reset valuations. Uh, high value stocks have really taken it on the chin. Uh, certainly the unprofitable stocks have taken it on the chin. Those uh, the, kind of in a rather unusual uh, moment of, of our markets here over the last several years, you know, for, you know, really almost a year, those were better performing than the best cash flow stories in the market uh, for a while. Well, that's completely unwound now. Uh, and I think that part of it is extremely healthy because uh, unprofitable companies shouldn't be rewarded with high valuations. Uh, and here we've seen just kind of a catharsis of sorts uh, in the NASDAQ 100. Again, very heav heavy on the tech side. Uh, it gets us down to kind of a, a new reset on valuations, which again, I think is going to be very healthy going forward. Well, and what I was talking about before with regard to kind of valuations, uh, certainly if you're looking at forward earnings, uh, excuse me, if you're looking at multiples based on forward earnings, you know, you have to have some belief in the integrity of those forecasts. and. Uh, what you're looking at here is basically, you know, forward-looking estimates 
uh, for the next couple of years uh, for not only the S&P 500 index itself, but also the value and the, and the growth components. And uh, those are depicted uh, on the right-hand side of this chart. And you can see that the trajectory is actually fairly strong. So obviously 2020, uh, we had a, a fairly pronounced decline and then we had the bounce back, uh, but there still is continued optimism that those are gonna be moving up uh, in, a, in a fairly high fashion. So the thing that I always caution about is, you know, what happens with earnings, you know, what, what is reality going to tell us when we get there? And, uh, and right now, looking at earnings for the S&P 500, you know, tracking close to 220 uh, for 2022, you know, that puts us at a level where we might expect about a 10 to 12% uh, increase and if we have no change in the market multiple, then you know that would seem to allow us to have anywhere between a maybe a 10 to 5, 10 to 15 percent move in the market. Uh, but you know time will tell. Uh, obviously, we've had uh, a kind of a, a downturn in uh, in company expectations that we literally just saw in the last slide. So I want to be careful about. Uh, Offering up this chart is kind of like a forecast of what we should expect. Uh, I think we'll know a lot more within the next three months of how some of these things are going to shake out, whether we have seen the peak of inflation. Uh, certainly, if we see the, the, the kind of the rolling over of Omicron and, you know, the, the transition from pandemic to endemic uh, and supply chain choke points beginning to ease, uh, you know, all of those things, you know, kind of mitigating somewhat, I think, makes this type of estimate that we're looking at here much, much more palatable. So this is a chart that shows us, you know, various, uh, I guess, cohorts of the market. And, you know, the blue line represents the index movement. And so, you know, we think about the current drawdown in these areas. And again, it's been, you know, it's been fairly reasonable, right? And so it's, it's it definitely caught our attention uh, here, this drawdown in January, but it's important to know that within each of these indices, uh, you know, the average stock has actually corrected much, much more. You know, they just haven't all done it at the same time. So, uh, you know, we talk about the market correction, you know, just understand that constituent firms within the index on average have corrected much, much greater. And take for instance, the S&P 500, which as of this uh, data capture, which I'm guessing was uh, a little bit earlier this week, you know, down 11% uh, on the total drawdown, but the average stock within the S&P 500 is down uh, from its peak about 18.7 or 19%. And it gets much worse for small caps uh, and on the technology side. You know, more technical indicators here on the market. Again, not a big surprise because of the drawdown and the volatility. You know, we've got two different data sets that I watch uh, actually uh, quite a bit. You know, first is the 50-day moving average. Uh, and that, that has a lot more oscillation to it. Uh, you know, obviously it's a shorter average uh, averaging only 50 days of, of closing price data versus the right-hand side, which is the 200-day moving average. And so what's uh, that's more of a longer-term trend. And so when you see markets, uh, you see the index level kind of break through its 200-day moving average, that's usually pretty telling. Uh, and it's also, uh, on the flip side, very correspondingly, very positive when you have a market that punches through uh, punches up through uh, its 200-day moving average. But as you can see here on the 50-day moving average, um, you know, the, you know, we, we have seen, you know, quite a, a pullback, you know, we, we've seen a pullback relative to that 50-day moving average. Uh, you know, there have been times like when during the shutdown where that was much, much greater, uh, but that's not the, I mean, it happens you know, uh, relatively often, I should say. Uh, and so it's not a shock there uh, that we're oscillating kind of negatively versus that in, that uh, uh, moving average. 
Now on the right hand side, that represents the number of or percent of S&P 500 constituents that are trading above their 200 day moving average. And, uh, you know, you can see that, you know, during the summer last year, uh, and actually through the better part of the first, you know, I'll call it, you know, uh, seven, eight months of the year, you know, no, over 90% of the index was trading above its 200 day moving average, which in a normal environment makes you think that, you know, there's a lot of breadth in the market back then, you know, that, that all these stocks were moving higher in unison. Uh, now that's definitely broken down, uh, started, uh, started that process in, um, in late summer. And you can see it's, it's kind of accelerated now to where we have less than half of the S&P 500 members that are trading above their 200 day moving average. Now we'll move into uh, the Fed, maybe a little fixed income before we close up here. So uh, this, is the, this is one of the things that's got the market uh, really kind of sideways right now uh, and, and, and causing it to struggle a bit. And that's the probability of rate hikes and the probability of the Fed not being able to control inflation, uh, maybe getting it wrong, uh, you know, having a policy mistake that maybe ultimately might slow the economy down too much. And so you have a lot of, you know, the Fed's not said that they're going to raise rates five times, four or five times in 2022. You know, people are interpreting this from their language. And, you know, I think they, last year, it, it was clear that they kind of, they kind of messed up basically that they, you know, you know, kept saying that all this inflation was transitory and they finally admitted that, well, maybe some of it's not. Uh, in fact, they were the only ones in the block to, they were the last one on the block rather to, to figure that out. I think we all had that pretty well scoped out for a long time. Now they've come back and said that they're, you know, obviously they want to control inflation. And so now you see that there's a 95.4% probability that the Fed is going to increase rates five times or 100 or 1.25% in 2022. And of course that gets everyone a lot nervous, uh, gets everyone nervous, I should say. Right hand side, you know, the implied uh, Fed funds rate, which is the rate that we're talking about, you know, moving from essentially zero, having the first rate hike here in another few weeks, another rate hike in May and then July, October, and then you finally get this fifth one, if you will, uh, January uh, a year from now. And so, uh, at the same time, the Fed is going to curb its asset purchases and eventually uh, cease purchasing, uh, you know, assets altogether. And after that, they're actually going to let some of their uh, bonds that, that are that they that they hold in the in the Fed's own inventory uh, mature and roll off, and they won't be replaced. So, you know, round about July, uh, we're going to begin to see the Fed's own balance sheet begin to shrink at the same time that they're raising rates. And so, this really has the market kind of in an uncertain area right now as far as where things are going to go. So in continuing this conversation about interest rates uh, and the fixed income market, so, you know, we just saw where the, the Fed is expected to raise rates fairly dramatically over the next year. Well, what's really interesting is that long-term rates like the 10-year and 30-year uh, have really not moved a whole lot. And, and that's, uh, you know, it actually fairly telling so that the expectations are building because of this flattening yield curve that uh, that maybe the Fed's interest rate increases what it's going to result in is a slower economy which in turn would you know argue for lower interest rates and that's exactly what's going on right now and so we haven't had a move in interest rates on the long end of the curve and this is a chart here that shows us basically the the spread between the 10-year and the and the two-year uh, Treasury, and so you see that that you know March, April earlier last year we had a fairly steep curve, you know, there, where there was the expectation of future growth as we were emerging from this uh, emerging from this uh, pandemic-related uh, slowdown, shutdown, whatever you want to call it, and then right about June, 
you know, then this is a time where we began to see a little bit of churn in, in the investment markets too. But you you saw this persistent inflation uh, issue uh, come up and this growing uh, expectation that the Fed was going to raise interest rates. And so, you know, you began to see short term rates move a little bit higher in uh, anticipation of the eventual rate increase, which I do believe we're going to see the first one here next month. At the same time, you know, you just didn't have the longer term uh, end of the curve because people were becoming maybe a bit more skeptical about how the Fed is going to be able to manage this uh, new rate cycle. And uh, and that is all culminated in where we are now, which is an extremely tight and extremely flat yield curve. Uh, and, the, and the difference between the 10 and the two year is really, really small right now. Now, here's a quick slide on commodities. Um, and so, uh, you know, just to bring you up to speed, we know that the commodity basket is still pretty high. Commodity investments overall are actually doing pretty well. You can see that the spot price uh, index for the basket of commodities, it continues to move higher. Now, on the right hand side, we've got metal prices uh, on a global scale. These are all indexed to uh, 2005. And what you can see here, is the spike and kind of the you know the unanimous uh, rise in prices amongst you know whether it be iron ore, nickel, aluminum, copper, uh, and gold uh, as well uh, over you know this this post crash or post shutdown period uh, and the forecasts again th these are you know the proof will be in the pudding but you know the forecast here at least near term is that you get some attenuation in some of these uh, areas like iron ore uh, and uh, nickel uh, and then uh, you know, aluminum and copper, you know, uh, you, you get at least a flat lining. So, you, so this number doesn't keep going up. And so I expect that the Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index will begin to level off a little bit and, and provide less of an inflation uh, impetus uh, for us probably in the second, third quarters of this year. Well, that will do it for the chart pack this week. On behalf of the entire team at BKA Wealth, uh, appreciate you spending uh, some time with us. I uh, hope you have a wonderful and productive week, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.